that you've gifted his life to come and share with us this morning. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Give it up for Justin. Hey. Amen. I did not invent the Nike swoosh in case you missed that part, but my dad was a restaurant owner, and he claims to have been the first restaurant in Indiana to have a salad bar. So there's that. It's my claim to fame. <clears throat> the son of the first man in Indiana with a salad bar. <laughs> Big scam. Why am I paying for, to make my own salad? Uh, so, <laughs> uh, again, my name is, is Justin. It is, it is really cool to be here with you guys this morning. I don't think I, I, I don't think, I know I haven't been able to make it up here to this particular vineyard uh, yet. I've tried to, tried to get around to as many as I can, but they keep popping up, and uh, so praise the Lord for that. Um, but anyway, uh, uh, we have been, Amanda and I have been a part of the vineyard movement for um, a long time. Uh, we spent about 11 years at the Syracuse Vineyard uh, in Syracuse, and uh, at the end of that time, we went with Travis and Jenica Conklin, uh, which I believe Travis came and spoke here a little, a little while ago. Uh, we left the Syracuse Vineyard with a, the Conklins, I think it was just the four of us when we started, uh, to plant the, the vine in Goshen, um, and we were there for about six years until, uh, and until the church was pretty well established, and and we were, had all these grand plans of, uh, you know, planting another church or starting some sort of parachurch ministry, maybe in Fort Wayne, maybe in Plymouth. We weren't even really sure. Um, and then, of course, the pandemic came along and, and sort of um, altered our plans. Obviously, I'm giving you the censored version of that story because the real version would require uh, a whole lot more time and expletives than the occasion here allows for. Uh, but to give you a few of the high points... Um, I make my living from a, a small business that I operate doing commercial photography and videography. Sounds cool. It's not. It's all, imagine an entire day taking pictures of furniture. That's me. That's my job. Or video of furniture. It doesn't move, okay? <laughs> <clears throat> um, but anyway, when the pandemic started, uh, I was rocking and rolling. I'd been going for several years at that point, and I got a call in the span of a week from every single client that I had panicked, saying, stop what you're doing, we're done, like, we, you know, we'll, after the two weeks to, like, you know, halt the spread or whatever, we'll reconnect then, and then we'll figure out what we're going to do after that, obviously, you know, probably, you can imagine where that went, it wasn't two weeks to halt the spread, it was years, and so, with my newfound unemployment, uh, I decided, you know what, I am going to use this time to develop an alternative revenue stream in the form of, like, uh, building up my social media platforms and then becoming an influencer and then monetizing by selling merch or some dumb stuff like that. However you make money on social media. So I started doing that, and I don't know, it was, it was a two-prong approach. I was thinking maybe an alternative revenue stream, but also being a church leader in the middle of a pandemic, <clears throat> it was a bit of an interesting time. I don't know if you all remember, but you pretty much all turned into like a bunch of hyper-political psychos. And <laughs> it wasn't just you. It was everybody, it was all the rage, pun intended. Uh, so I thought, I thought, you know, if I'm gonna be posting all these videos anyway and building up my social media platform, I might as well utilize the opportunity to like bring a little lighthearted humor to the situation. And so I was making all these funny videos as much as I could, and it was working. Like people just kept telling me over and over, man, I just, I really look forward to your videos. It's really such a ray of sunshine in this dystopian hellscape that we live in. And I was like, yeah. And, and then of course I was getting all these comments and it was up to like 15,000 followers and it was like just I could not get enough this is amazing it's working so great until I shattered my ankle making a TikTok video not even joking uh there should be possibly a, a picture somewhere of my shattered ankle um the good news is that it only took there it is yeah seven screws uh the the bump out part of your ankle on the in, on the inside literally broke off they had to screw it back on with the screw it's it was savage man um the good news is though it only took about twenty five thousand dollars in a year and a half to get back to relative normality um somewhere in there though uh we got a call from the uh the pastors of the branches vineyard in in warsaw and uh they said to amanda 
you know, hey, would you ever consider candidating for the lead pastor position at, at Branches? Because they were, they were as beat up as many pastors were and were ready to, to take a break. And so we prayed about it for a while and we thought, you know what? Uh, Justin's relearning how to walk and unemployed and, uh, you know, we're hemorrhaging cash. Uh, this seems like a perfect time to take over a church in the middle of a pandemic, global pandemic, right? So I know what you're thinking. Um, total missed opportunity. You should have gone to seminary at the same time. We thought of that too. Uh, Amanda went to seminary and um, somehow just graduated in July with her Master's of New Testament Theology. Uh, super, super proud of her. I don't, literally don't know how she did it. I don't know how, I don't know how we did it. It was, God was so, so good to us. Um, so obviously, I'm trying to make light of uh, the difficulties and laugh at the difficulties of the last few years, because what else can you do? Um, but they've been pretty hard. That was, just, that was just a few of the highlights. There were other things, you know. My dad broke his hip. The, there was a massive flood at my parents' house that took an entire year to repair, and they're elderly, so, like, I had to do all of it. All of the, not re the repairs, but the insurance stuff, and... Um, a transmission went out somewhere in there. My dad broke his hip again. Uh, yeah, bad stuff. It, and, and of course, you know, uh, friends were getting sick. Some friends died. Maybe you can relate with that experience. You know, perhaps these last couple of years have changed your life in ways that you didn't anticipate. Or perhaps you lost someone that you love, you know, to COVID. Um, you're probably still coming out of a uh, season of isolation and learning to navigate this new landscape of family and work and church relationships. Um, you might even, even have some tough questions for God that he's not too keen to give you tidy answers for, you know, and you're just sort of holding them up like, okay, whenever you're ready, Lord, we can resolve this, you know. Our plans are ruined or put on hold, or at least mine were, you know. Um, our metaphorical or possible literal bones are broken and still trying to heal. Money is tight, and it's getting tighter, and um, the world feels like it's on fire, you know? But you know what this sounds like to me? This sounds like the perfect time for a huge, risky leap of faith with God, um, a leap forward together with God, together as a church family. So Cornerstone Vineyard, um, this is God's call for you this year. This is your leap year. That is your vision for this year. And so to that end, I want to encourage you, uh, if you're feeling beat up and uncertain about the future, and if money is tight and you're feeling totally out of control, uh, then just like me, it is probably the perfect time for you to say yes to God uh, and make a huge, scary, risky leap of faith towards God in your relationships. And so that's what we're going to spend uh, the next few weeks talking about. Starting today, uh, we're going to be talking about taking uh, risky leaps forward with God by saying yes to deeper relationship with others in a series called Relationship Status. Relational status with God, with our spouses, with families, with, with our children. Um, and this morning, we're actually going to talk about our workplace relationships, taking leaps forward in our Workplace relationships, workplace meaning like work or war zone. As we, as we come together, and you know, I heard a giggle out there, you can probably relate, you know, with that feeling of workplace or war zone. As we're all coming back together out of, out of a, you know, a season of isolation and we're learning to navigate this new landscape, you know, with our families and our work and church relationships, I want to tell you that we have an opportunity to say yes to what God is doing in our day. And we have, it's a really rare opportunity to revisit our relationship statuses, to essentially reinvent ourselves in our relationships if that's what God has for us. And we cannot waste this opportunity. I'll say it again, we cannot waste this opportunity. You know how I know this? I know this because our plans are ruined and or put on hold and you know, there's uncertainty all around, and money is tight, and it's getting tighter, uh, and the world feels like it's on fire, and that's how I know this is the perfect time uh, for a big leap forward with our relationship statuses, because this is precisely when God does his best work. Amen? So God began uh, his in plan just like this, to save and rescue the entire world. He always does it this way. He, he called a man named Abram who was later named Abraham, 
And we read that about that in Genesis, and he, and he called him to start a family, to, uh, and that family would become a vast nation, and through that nation, God was going to rescue and save the world. So he, he called Abram, and he said, Abram and, your wi- and his wife, um, you're like 100 years old, and you don't have any children, uh, but this seems like a perfect time for you to start a family, and I'm going to use that family to save the world, right? That's how God does things, right? When that family was on the brink of starvation from a, a multi-year drought, uh, God used one of the, the sons of that family because, of course, God kept his promise and he provided a family for Abram. But one of those uh, grandsons uh, was sold into slavery by his brothers because they were, um, they were jealous of him. And so God said, you know what, Joseph? You're, you were betrayed by your brothers and sold into slavery and now you're rotting in a jail cell. This seems like a perfect time. Uh, to start a plan to save your family, to save your nation, uh, and take a big leap forward with God. That same family, hundreds of years later, um, the nation of Israel was, was enslaved in Egypt. Again, we you know, read about this in the book of Exodus. Um, the people of God were being exploited as a disposable workforce. And so God said, hey, I've got an idea. Let's take Moses. Uh, he's a disgraced murderer who fled from his homeland in disgrace. He's 80 years old, and he has a speech impediment. That seems like a perfect time with the perfect guy to uh, liberate the people of Israel from Egyptian oppression and lead them into um, independence. Similarly, this season that we're in, we've been through a global disaster that's left millions dead. Our relationships are in tatters. We're divided and fighting over you know, dozens of political and social issues. Our workplaces can feel like a minefield of off-limits topics and trigger words and tension. Uh, and I don't know about you, but based on God's track record, this seems like just the sort of situation that God shows up in to do amazing things. Um, this has been God's playbook all along. That playbook culminated in the death and resurrection of Jesus, and that same playbook is at work in and through the church today. So let me ask you, who do you hate at work? I'm, I'm being serious. Who hates you? Who, who are you rooting against? Who do you want to get fired? Who, who is the other in your workplace, right? Yeah. Uh, I know that you're probably cordial to these people's faces, but who do you disdain on the inside? Your, your workplace minefield of conflict, I'm telling you, that it is the tilled up soil waiting for God's kingdom to be planted. He has allowed the soil to be tilled and he's given you the seeds of his gospel. But that seed will only grow in your obedience to love. So what does it look like for us to take leaps forward in our workplace relationships? Well, I think uh, we can get some clues from how Israel responded when God uh, was calling them. Uh, So if you have your Bible or a Bible app, cue up Nehemiah 4, uh, verses, we're going to be in verses 15 through 23. To give you just a little bit of context of of Ezra and Nehemiah, the the two books are actually both part of the same scroll in Hebrew. Uh, They're broken up into two books in our uh, version of the Bible, but they're actually one story, one document, and that's not uncommon in the Old and New Testament. Uh, But the story is all about how uh, Israel is trying to rebuild their capital city, Jerusalem and uh, specifically the temple and the city wall. And Ezra is the story of the temple, Nehemiah is the story of the city wall. After they were destroyed by Babylon. Um, But it wasn't just about having a place to worship in the temple or having some means of defense, as in the wall, uh, around the city from an invading army. It was actually more about them rebuilding and not losing and preserving their identity as God's people. Um, And so the scroll of Ezra and Nehemiah picks up about 50 years after Israel was conquered by Babylon. So like many empires, Babylon, uh, their their sort of playbook for conquering and, you know, getting bigger and bigger and bigger is that they would, would, you know, attack and dominate a people group with brute military force. And then, you know, they would take the survivors of their military conquest— and they would just scatter them and relocate them all over the empire, all over, all over ba- Babylon. Uh, and, and so the idea was that they're dispersed and they're all alone. Eventually, they, over time, they'll just give up and become Babylonian, right? They'll, they'll lose their, their traditions. They'll lose their gods. They'll lose their religion. They'll lose it all. 
and eventually they'll just assimilate into Babylonian culture. The empire was like the dominant force in the world, and so their language and their culture and values and gods and currency and economic and government models and their education and art and technological advancements, it was like they were the, the standard. They were the, you know, the, the gateway into prosperity in the world because they held all the wealth. So the thought was that if, they, if the people were all spread out in tiny pockets all over the empire, they would just cave over time, right? Um, they wouldn't have the collective strength to keep uh, and, and hold on to their religious and cultural identities, their language, their traditions. Um, maybe the first generation would hold on, but their kids would probably let go of a little bit, and then their kids would let go of a little bit more. And then at some point, you know, all hope of that people group you know, coming together and then rising up against the empire would be just lost. They would just you know, be swallowed up in the slow tide of cultural assimilation. Even if you hated the empire and hated everything it stood for, um, at some point, the benefits of joining it would just outweigh the costs. And you would eventually just give up. That's, that's empire's playbook. So that's the context that Israel finds itself in, okay? They've been in, in it for 50 years. Israel was conquered by Babylon. Uh, the capital city was destroyed. The temple, the walls, the people were exiled, meaning they were forced out of their own country, dispersed across Babylon. And in the meantime, 50 years goes by. So Babylon... And, and while that is all happening, Babylon is actually conquered. The conqueror that conquered Israel is themselves conquered by Persia. So this new guy comes in, uh, Persia, the, the new emperor, comes into power. His name is Cyrus. And he's looking to gain favor with his new subjects, right? And they're gods, you know, because any god that's on his side is, you know, good for, good for him, right? So when the Jewish leaders go to, to Cyrus and say, hey, our city's in ruins and our temple is destroyed. We would love to be able to rebuild our temple. Cyrus is like, okay, you know, you put in a good word in for, with your God for me and, and I'll pay for it. Go, take anybody you want. Go ahead, go ahead and rebuild your temple. So that's what they do. Most of the Israelites stayed in Babylon because empire, if the, the playbook works, they, were, they had lost all their cultural identity. They had a new life. They had new jobs. They had new careers and families and gardens and homes and they didn't want to leave it. So they stayed. But about 42,000 people went back to their homeland to rebuild the temple. That's what we see in the book of Ezra. The problem with this whole enterprise is that the Jewish people hadn't had any claim on this place or this land in like 50 years. While they were gone, other hostile people groups occupied that place, and they hadn't been bothered by anybody for the last 50 years under Babylonian rule. But now under Persian rule, all these people are coming back in mass, and they're building this temple to this weird god, Yahweh, and displacing them, right? Now, years later, they finish the temple, and to make matters even worse, they're trying to rebuild their city walls. Mind you, the, this is like the ancient equivalent of Iran enriching uranium or something like that. I mean, this is, this is seen, as, even though it's meant to be a defensive measure, this is easily seen as a provocation. And if Persia gets wind of this, and if they see it as a provocation, empire comes down hard, and they come home hard with military force, and that means doom for everybody. Arabs, Ammonites, Israelites, all of them are going to get crushed if Persia gets the wrong idea about this whole thing. So all this adds up to Israel trying to rebuild their city walls as a means of re obtaining, reobtaining their identity as God's people. And everybody around them saying, you're going to bring Persia down on us. That's going to be bad. We will kill you if you do not stop trying to build this wall. This is stupid. This is pointless it's you gotta stop okay so that's the context that we jump into uh in the book of nehemiah so let's pick it up there this is chapter four we're going to read the whole passage and then we're going to go back over and sort of highlight some ways that we can learn about how to take big leaps forward in our relationship statuses um, in what has become a, an isolating and hostile time so picking up in verse 14 then as i this is nehemiah speaking <clears throat> looked over the situation I called together the nobles and the rest of the people and said to them, don't be afraid of the enemy. Remember the Lord who is great and glorious and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. When our enemies heard that we knew of their plans, meaning like their plans to destroy the Israelites and stop them from rebuilding the wall, when, the, when our enemies heard that we knew of their plans and that God had frustrated them, we all returned to work on the wall. But from then on, only half my men worked while the other half stood guard with spears, shields, bows, and coats of mail. 
the leaders stationed themselves behind the people of Judah uh, who were building the wall. The laborers carried on their work with one hand supporting a load and the other hand holding a weapon. All the builders had a sword belted to their side. The trumpeter stayed with me to sound the alarm. Then I explained to the nobles and officials and all the people, the work is very spread out, we are, and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. So when you hear the blast of the trumpet, rush to wherever it's sounding, and then our God will fight for us. Okay, so from here I want to take just three observations from this passage um, that, we can, that we can make about our, our workplace relationships based on a kingdom of God perspective. But I want to make one cl critical clarification before we move forward with those three points. And that critical clarification is this. The Old Testament is Israel's story. Ezra, Ezra and Nehemiah being a part of the Old Testament is Israel's story. We're grafted into that story, okay? So we are a part of it now, uh, but that story has been fulfilled. It's been fundamentally changed um, by the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. We're included in that story because we believe in Jesus, because we believe in the gospel. The gospel is the story of Jesus fulfilling the story of Israel uh, by dying and being risen from the dead as Israel's Messiah. So the resurrection of Jesus as Israel's Messiah has changed everything, okay? Um, it's what made it possible for Gentiles like us to be counted among God's people. Um, it inaugurated the kingdom of God on earth. And so, the, you know, no longer is God's presence limited to one ethnic group or one nation state like Israel. Every single person on the planet is now a potential citizen of the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. Uh, the kingdoms of the world are still defined by geographic territories and governments and borders. Um, but the kingdom of God arrives everywhere that the range of God's rule is made effective by the self-sacrificing love of his people, the church. So, here's the point. When we read scriptures like this, we need to read them in, through the lens of Jesus coming. Because, uh, because of Jesus, we no longer fight like humans do, okay? So like Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10, the, the weapons that we fight with are no longer the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. People are no longer our enemy. So, here's the point. Cornerstone Vineyard, as we are returning from the metaphorical exile of COVID and navigating the tricky minefield of off-limits topics and trigger words and tension, remember who the real enemy is. I'll give you a hint. It's not your coworker. Remember who the real enemy is. Our text told us, don't be afraid of the enemy. Remember the Lord who is great and glorious and fights. So let me ask you again, who do you hate at work? Who's your enemy at work? Who hates you? Who are you rooting against? Who do you want to get fired? Who do you disdain on the inside even though you're nice to their face? They are not your enemy. Your workplace minefield of conflict is the tilled up soil that is waiting for God's kingdom to be planted. He has allowed the, sil the, to uh, the soil to be tilled up and he's given you the seeds of his gospel, but it's only going to grow in your obedience to love. So this is how we fight the real enemy. We do it with loving relationships. So this is the first observation we're going to make for taking big leaps forward in our relationships um, in our workplaces. Remember the Lord and fight the real enemy. The enemy comes to steal and kill and destroy people. And friends, we have done the enemy's work for him long enough. We need to stop doing the enemy's work for him. Remember the Lord who is great and glorious and fight the real enemy. The real enemy. So as you head into your job, remember what you're there for. You are there as an ambassador for Christ, as it says in 2 Corinthians 5, pleading with your life and with your actions and with your love for people to be reconciled to God. And this is important. This is more important than any job title or any job description that you have or ever could have. So when your coworker is 
actively, you know, sabotaging your reputation to benefit themselves, or when they show up, you know, reeking of pot or alcohol or something like that, and you have to try to cover for them, or when they just suck at their job and, and, and you have to pick up the slack, or when they go off about their conservative or liberal politics, or, you know, they say something really racist, or they interpret something that you said is really racist, and now everybody in the office thinks you're a racist, and, you know, remember the Lord. He is great and glorious and fight. Remember who the real enemy is. The real enemy is sin and death and Satan and anything that's keeping people away from the love of God, not your coworkers. Remember the Lord who is great and glorious and fight. Remember who the real enemy is. It's not them. And remember why you're really there. It's not just to make a paycheck and go home. Now, you might be thinking, I thought I was supposed to be working as unto the Lord. Doesn't that mean that I should be focusing on my job performance and doing the best that I can and excelling and making my bosses happy? Like it says in 2 Corinthians 3, or Colossians 3, excuse me. That is an astute observation. I'm glad you brought that up. So let's go back to verse 16 for another snapshot. It says, but from then on, only half my men worked while the other half stood guard. Can you, this is just a side note here. Can you imagine, like, this is the, a wall the size of a city. It's like, I forget, like 50 feet thick, and it was like 50 feet high or something, and it's in a pile of rubble, scorched and burned, and you're trying to sift through it all, and only about half of you are actually working, and the other half are just standing there, you know, as working as unto the Lord. I don't know. <clears throat> End of side note. Sorry about that. So just like the Israelites in the story, uh, we have a real enemy, right? Just like them, you know, they're, half of the workforce is standing around just watching the horizon because they had a real enemy. We have a real enemy that is looking to destroy, to destroy everything that we've built, just like Israel. Um, so we have to be ready to fight all the time with loving relationship, um, but we also have to keep building the wall. Like, we have to keep doing the physical task that is before us. Our enemy is a spiritual one that requires spiritual weapons, but our work is still very much of this world. Um, and it still needs to get done. And we do actually still need that paycheck to pay our bills. So this is the second observation that I want to make for taking big leaps in our work relationship status. Is, is this. Your interests will always be divided between your physical job and your spiritual one. Remember who the real enemy is and fight them. And remember that your interests are always going to be divided between your physical job and your spiritual one. Uh, years ago, I had uh, I used to be an electrician before I got into the video business. Bit bit of a pivot. Might have overcorrected. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> but I loved I loved the job. It was a fun job. And um, after I'd been in it for several years, I spent about ten years in the industry. I got I got a job for this company, and it was like my dream job. It, the benefits were awesome. The boss was amazing. I loved him. Um, the, it, I got, had a company vehicle and, and like healthcare and retirement money and just the whole nine, right? The, but there was one catch. I was the guy with the least amount of seniority. And so I got partnered up with the boss's cousin and the boss's cousin, um, was just whatever you're imagining. It's that. And, and then like times 10, like he, he, he never showed up to work on time. He, um, he was very troubled guy. He routinely sold drugs on the job site. Um, he had a big scar on his face around which his beard grew really patchy. So he had like this, I don't know, pirate aesthetic. It was, and he, he like, he, he was just a rough guy. He was constantly costing the company money with, you know, like by, I mean, he was just hours and hours and hours on his phone. He barely worked and, and um, he was rude to customers. And so you constantly had to like, try to figure out a way to get him in a basement somewhere where he can just scroll on his phone and, and not do any damage, right? So here I am. I'm new at this company. I want to do a good job for the boss. I really like the boss. I, I, you know, I want this guy to get a taste of God's kingdom. My interests are divided, you know, uh, and so I start trying to get to know this guy, and, and um, I got to do my job. I got to, we got to do a good job, so I got to figure out how to get, keep this guy productive. It's not working, but I also need this guy to get a taste of the kingdom. So I learn his story, and of course, he has this horribly tragic story, and his, his mother had died like, of this horrific illness, and 
and you know he his kids had been taken away and he was living in these terrible circumstances and and i i was just beginning this guy was becoming so human to me and i was trying to love him and be kind to him and and share the gospel with him and um i wish i could tell you that um he received it all and made a change in his life and got saved and started coming to my church it, none of that happened i i love this guy the best that i could and i i covered for this guy the best that i could um but it didn't work it didn't work he ended up getting fired um I don't know what became of him after that. And, and that's, that's kind of the disappointing punchline to a lot of these workplace relationships that we have. Our interests are divided. You know, we've got the job. We've got to get it done. We also have this, this minefield of, of, like, conflict surrounding our problematic coworkers. We're trying to love them. Sometimes it turns out disappointing. I have, pl- you know, plenty of stories of people who, that did get saved and did start coming to my church. And, but I picked that story because... Um, Sometimes it doesn't work out that way. That's the reality that we live in. It's the tension that we live in, the divided interest that we live in. It's the, it's the now and the not yet of our workplace relationships. I wish I could tell you that the tension gets easier, that the tension that we live in of our spiritual job and our physical job, but it doesn't get easier. It just You just sort of get used to it over time. It's the now and the not yet of the workplace. It's the kingdom of God arriving, right? The kingdom of God has arrived in Jesus and our, in our daily lives must serve to give other people a taste of it. Um, but the kingdom is also not fully here yet, which means that we still have to do our jobs um, the best that we can, even when, che- even when people choose to stay broken or when they mock us or make fun of us or when people try to use us or take advantage of us or when we screw it up and fail to love them and have to repent and ask for their forgiveness. I've had to do that a lot of times. Um, we, we still do our jobs with integrity and we serve our coworkers with Christ's love, no matter what. Um, now you might be saying to yourself, okay, but that's all fine in theory, but I'm the only Christian at my work and all of my coworkers are really worldly. You don't understand the risk that you're asking me to take. You know, maybe you travel for work and you're surrounded by really worldly people for days at a time and you're all alone. Or maybe you're, you know, new to the faith and you don't know what to say, and you don't know how to share your faith, and you don't know anything about the Bible. Um, or maybe, maybe your job, you know, ha- has placed you with some sort of ethical or moral dilemma that is at odds with your faith, and you're trying to figure out how to navigate it. What then? You know, what do you do then? It's another amazing observation. I'm really glad you brought that up. Let's go back to our verse. Uh, this is 19. It says, Then I explained to the nobles and officials uh, and all the people, the work is very spread out, and we are separated from each other along this wall. So when you hear the blast of the trumpet, um, rush to wherever it's sounding, and then God will fight for us. So let's just take a second and recap here. Um, recap what we've seen in this passage so far, or what, or, or what we're trying to take from it to take big leaps in our workplace relationship statuses. Remember the Lord and fight the real enemy. Your coworker is not your enemy. It's not the thing that we're fighting against it's the thing that we're fighting for. Your coworkers are the people that you're fighting for in defense against the real enemy. Your interests, therefore, are always going to be divided between your physical job and your spiritual job. We live in the now, now and the not yet of the kingdom, and that means that you will always have the obligation to keep bringing the kingdom in love and service to your coworkers, no matter how they respond to it. Okay, And we also have to do the best that we can um, at our physical jobs, as if we were working for the Lord. And this is what we see in verse 19 and 20. We are spread out, uh, and we're separated. So we need a system of support. We need an alarm to sound and someone to respond to that alarm when we're in trouble, right? So this is the observation, the third observation we can make for taking big leaps in our work relationship statuses, and it is this. We absolutely need to be meaningfully and faithfully connected to the church. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, it, 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 it sounds really simple, and it is really simple, but I can tell you from like 18 years of church leadership and ministry experience, most people um, 
see being present with their church family as wholly optional. And it's not. I mean, if you want to follow Jesus, it's not, you know. If you want Jesus to be some, you know, character in your story, then yeah, it's optional. But if you want to be a part of God's story, it's not optional, right? If, if church for you is something that you do when you feel like it or when you've had a good week or when it hasn't been a long week or when your kids have behaved really well that morning, um, I, want, I want you to try and receive this as just a loving kick in the pants from a brother in Christ. That's, that's lame. That's freaking lame. You are better than that. Uh, you can do better than that. You need to do better than that because someone in this church is going through hell right now. And they are blowing the horn. You know, they need help. They're sounding the alarm. This is an emergency. And it might be, it might be that God has given you the exact thing that that person needs to get through another week. And they're going to miss out on it because you had a long week and didn't feel like getting up early. Or your kids were acting crazy. Or maybe they had the slightest little sniffle and you're like, oh, they're sick. We're not going to church, you know. Or the opposite could also be true, um, that your coworker might be going through the fight of their lives, and they, you might have exactly what they need to find hope in an otherwise miserable and hopeless time, and you won't have that gift to give to them, to help them, because it was a part of a sermon that you weren't there to listen to, or it was a part of mini a ministry time, or there was a word of knowledge that somebody was supposed to give to you but didn't because you weren't there. Opportunities pass, and sometimes they don't come around again. You are a part of a spiritual battle, and you are not going to have any hope of lasting for yourself or for anyone else in the long haul if you're trying to do it alone. So let's recap one more time. We have a really rare opportunity to revisit our relationship statuses, and we cannot waste it. Our plans are ruined, and they're put on hold, um, there's uncertainty all around us. Money is, t is tight and it's getting tighter and the world feels like it's on fire. And so this is the perfect time. Based on the way God does stuff, this is the perfect time to take a big leap forward in our relationship statuses. That's when God does his best work. So your workplace minefield of conflict is the tilled up soil waiting for God's kingdom to be, to be planted. He's allowed the soil to be tilled up and he's given you the seed of his gospel, but it's only going to grow in your obedience to love your co-workers and so remember who the real enemy is remember who you're fighting for and remember who you're fighting against you're fighting for your co-workers not against them your interests therefore are always going to be divided between fighting for them aka bringing the kingdom to them in loving relationships and just doing your regular job that's the way it's always going to be for the rest of your life your interests are always going to be divided between your physical job and your spiritual one that's a daunting task and we're all spread out therefore you need to be absolutely need to be meaningfully and faithfully connected to a church with that being said we're going to transition to uh, a time of response here um, if the band wants to come back up um, every week we take some time um, I, I believe you guys take some time to uh, reflect and respond to what has been taught so we are going to worship a little bit more, and we're going to make uh, some time available to pray. So I want to give this specific um, challenge or opportunity to pray. Uh, if, if, that, um, if that idea of, or if the thought of, or the question of, who do I hate at work, or who is my enemy at work, if that was brought conviction to your heart um i think that conviction is from the holy spirit i think you need to listen to it and so we're going to make an opportunity for you to receive prayer um, and possibly receive maybe a little bit of repentance from god uh, and have a little bit of reshaping in your heart to go back to work tomorrow or tuesday or whenever you go back um with a little bit of a a, a different heart to see your co-workers as no longer your enemies but rather the people that god has put you there to help love and to serve so if that is you and you are uh convicted in your heart and looking for 
uh, God, to, to change you and, and take away that enmity and put love uh, in your heart. Um, make your way over here. Matt and I want to, uh, to pray, pray for you. Um, for all the rest of you, um, yeah, let's, let's press into what, whatever it is that God has.